Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hey, Karen, thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to hearing all about your different projects that you're doing. Um, some very special ones as well, I know. So, um, yeah, nice to have you. How are you? You know what? Thanks for inviting me. Really excited to be with you. Anywhere where there's a VW camper van, you can find me. So like, I was very excited to be invited. And uh, <laughs> thanks, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's One day I'll own one of those. <laughs> oh, no, tell me about it. <laughs> a really high end, really beautiful one, I'm sure. Yeah, that's what I'd like. Yeah. Yeah, no, tell me. <laughs> I, 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 I'm waiting for the electric one to come out. Do you know what I mean? So, oh, an, yeah. old, an old fashioned one, but electric, that will be yeah, awesome. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't like to say how much that'd be, though. No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, one day, maybe. Um, <laughs> so, Karen. Um, I always get everybody who comes on the show to talk about their past lives. <laughs> 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 but we have so many lives in a lifetime. Um, we, we'd love to hear where it all began for you. So where were you born? Have you moved around a bit about your education, etc.? So over to you, Karen. Ah, oh, thank you. So, <clears throat> well, I'm a Londoner. You would never guess by the accent, I guess. So born and bred, I've lived in London but and worked in London all my life. So I was born in the 60s um, and I was born in Battersea in South London yeah. and uh, to teenage parents. Wow. And um, my granddad, he um, got them to make a decision on what they did. And one of the choices for me was luckily that they would get married. So they got married on my mother's birthday. Um, it's a sweet birthday, sweet, um, <laughs> sweet 16. So they got wow. married on that day. Yeah. And I was born, you know, a little, little bit after. Hmm. So both teenagers and obviously thrown together by that. So we live with my grandparents like for the first 10 years of my life. And they saved up to get themselves, you know, on the property ladder. It was an important thing. So they did. They saved up, bought a house. And um, then they had my brother. And we, that, my dad was a builder. So he did lots of building work, decorating work, ran his own business for many years. And I suppose that might be where the entrepreneurial side of me sort of came out. Yeah. So I used to, you know, be a very lively child I used to have lots of hobbies I used to do all different classes clubs I was in the brownies I was in the girl guides I used to uh, be in the St John's ambulance brigade as a cadet and I, I used to like always get involved and, and want to do things you know yeah and um I suppose it carried me through at school you know I used to do quite a bit of um acting at school and I was always cast as the bad girl, you know, or the, the witch or in, in like any sort of story where there was a baddie, I was always the baddie. I think I longed to be the princess, but like, I was yeah. always really the witch. So I think it was because I was too loud to be the princess. <laughs> and I suppose my life carried on at that. And um, when I was 16, like I, I wanted to leave school and I, I didn't really like school. No. And um, I thought that, you know, like the time off before your GCSEs was time to just do whatever you wanted and relax before you had some exams. Yeah. So I didn't do very well at school. I bought three GCSEs, um, English literature and language. So English language was mainly that I could speak English and no other language. And I think, I don't know, how yeah. I managed to pass. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> then English literature was an interesting one. I had to read... Um, Far from the Madding Crowds, and I had to read um, Romeo and Juliet. So I bought the keynotes that help you, you know, when you're reading the book to partial exam. So I just read the keynotes. I never actually read either of the books and right. I passed. <laughs> so oh. then keynotes are good, like kids, you know, read keynotes. They're meant to assist you, but I, I chose to use them because they were yeah. like this thin. 
they were like this thin and the book was this thick. So I thought, oh, I'm going to go with that one. Yeah. Anyway, very good. I love cookery. So I did a lot of cookery and I still do. And that was my biggest achievement. I got a B in cookery. So uh, two C's well, and a B. And I decided, like, you know, I wanted to um, just get, get out and earn some money. Now, I always wanted to be a nurse. As I said, I was in St. John Ambulance Brigade. I used to volunteer in hospitals and it was the aim really to go into nursing but at 16 you had to wait till you was 18 so I thought I'm going to get a job first yeah so I got a job and I and I started to work for NatWest RBS at 16 right and I worked up in the West End I worked in Tottenham Court Road and at 16 um, yeah that was with the days eh? oh my god so <laughs> I loved it I loved it okay uh, I used to go dance in Leicester Square every Friday night. I used to blow all my wages on handbags yeah. and shoes. And yeah. I lived at home. And, like, you know what? It, it was a great life. And after two years, then I could become a nurse. But in them two years, I was earning quite a good salary, you know, for my age. Yeah. And it was way more than a, a trainee nurse would get. Yeah, And I met a boy and you know <laughs> I decided not to go into nursing so I carried on and, and I got married I got married at 19 so I look like a right wild child so I got married at 19 and uh, we moved into a council flat and the girl on the corner next saw she had a baby so I thought well that looks good I think <laughs> I'll have some of that <laughs> <laughs> so I had my son when I was 20 Wow. And um, then I had to, I've got, I've got, a, well, my son's 37 and I've got a 35 year old and a 31 year old. So that's what I did. And I had a career break in that time from my job with NatWest. So they, they used to give you like a five year gap. So I squeezed the children into that gap and I went back to work for them after that when I had the children because money was tight. Um, and yeah. um, that was, that is what I needed to do. So I went back. Um, my marriage lasted the first marriage, you know, like 12 years. And then I, we split up, always mm. raised the children together, but I continued with my career in banking. Lucky I had my secure job and yeah. all was good. And then I, in the end, I remarried. I've been married 25 years actually next year. So I sort of, uh, spent quite a big proportion of my life married or having children. Brilliant. And, um, when I did get divorced, I just needed to focus really and get money. And that's yeah. when in the bank I started to really get climbing up the ladder. So I went from you know, like being a cashier to being a counter manager to being an assistant manager to being like um, all different jobs like managerial until I got my first branch. I became a, a branch manager. And yeah. then I became an area manager. And so I became quite a senior manager in the end. And so I had a really yeah. great career, including the career break. You know, my career actually spanned 34 years. So I joined at 16 and I left sort of for good at 50. Yeah. And that was in 2013. Right. I right. did all jobs, you know, lots, everything. But the last five years... I was managing um, people, doing courses about people management. So I was yeah. coaching and mentoring and developing managers that were over, you know, like over a certain level and yeah. also some executive coaching, some quite senior people in the bank. And at 50, um, there was a brown envelope and I thought, well, I, I shall take that. And I decided to leave. Right. Um, in 2013 and my life I'd always been maybe a bit different as a bank manager I was always about the people and the customers and people has always been a you know managing people working in teams has always been important to me sure. and um, I decided to start my own business so I started G development which is coaching and training and development and uh, mentoring business which is what I was sort of in and um, basically I had six months gardening leave so I couldn't really do anything at first so what I did was 
I joined the Samaritans and I became a Samaritan in that time. Mm-hmm. And we always had pets. I've, I've grown up ever since I was a child. We always had a dog, a cat, and my, my married life's never been much different. And we had two Dalmatians at that time that we'd had from when the kids were little. And um, they passed away when I was leaving the bank in, in 48 hours, the two of them. Oh, and no. it was like a big, horrific, you know, thing. And um, one of my, my middle daughter, she uh, works for the RSPCA and yeah. she's an animal welfare officer. And um, she, we were moping around, you know, it was a big trauma. And she was like, you need to get another dog. She said, the only way you're going to get over this is to get another dog. So I was like, oh, okay. And she said, oh, you need to get a staffy. She said, there's lots of staffies. They really need homes. Mm. So I was like, okay, I I don't think so. And I said, I think they're quite aggressive dogs, you know. Yeah. And my daughter went mad and she said, you're part of the problem. And and she told me, she said, like, you know, they're fantastic dogs. It's the owners and et cetera. So I went away and I investigated it. And I found out, you know, that they were the nanny dog that they were, you know, let's look after the children when the parents were working and the men went out to war and, you know, they had a big history. But, yeah, they, they're they a tough little dog. Yeah. And they're used in dog fighting, not because they like to fight, but they've got quite a grip. So when yeah. they latch on, they don't let go and things like that. So they've been a victim of their own sort of look because yep. people thought that, if you've got a tough dog, you're tough. So it was interesting. I said to my daughter, okay, look, I, I, we'll get we'll get a staff, yeah, like, you know, hands up, like, I think that, yeah, that, you know, I'm going to get a staff. So basically she said, right, okay, there's lots of staff, so I'm going to find you, like, lovely staff. And yeah. um, as I said, well, that year I was 50 and I had a big trip for a month planned and, um, like a week or two before she says right I found you this stuff is lovely and I said yeah well I'm going away for a month and it's a bit irresponsible you know so yeah. I think I'm gonna have to wait until I come home yeah. and I did have older children who would have looked after her at home but I thought oh you know what I'd rather be there so she said well there's they come along you know all the time so she said don't worry I'll get another one this one is really cute but you know don't worry so I went off on my trip yeah come back and like a week later she's on the phone she said that staff is still at the Harmsworth at the Harmsworth Animal Hospital and um she said like you know I don't know how much longer he's been he's been there like he'd been there now then for like five weeks and um I said okay okay I I said all right then what do we have to do you know if we want to adopt him she's like I've got him in the van I'm on my way home (laughs) so I was like okay um right all right so he basically been waiting all that time he waited for me yeah he's waiting for me now he's looking at me i'm just trying to make him come over and say hello to everyone but i will do before yeah yeah and we must see him so we got dodger and dodger was a cute little puppy someone drove up to the harmsworth and they just said they found him in the street and they left him there basically and they said well no we don't take healthy dogs and they went well I don't care, you know, you do what you want. And he sort of tried to follow him back to his car, Dodger. Oh. And um, the nurse, the kennel maid, they grabbed him, got him in there, found out that he'd got septic mange, which is um, like a skin condition that a lot of foxes yeah. have got. You know, if yeah. you see a fox with a bald tail, then they normally got septic mange. Anyway, oh. so we got him home and he was just adorable. And, and I was on this six months gardening lathe. Um, because that was at the time then I got made redundant, literally yeah. also the day I came back from the holiday. Yeah. And um, I've become a Samaritan. So I decided to start raising some money for the Samaritans and I decided to do a walk with my daughter. It's 25K. Mm. And um, I have to tell you, I was very overweight, very. I've lost five stone since wow. that, them days. Um, and... Um, one of the first things, that, yeah, so I did this walk actually being really overweight and really unhealthy, but he was my coach and mentor, you know, Dodger. 
and he used to walk with me every day and we built wow. it up to when I was walking about in the end 22k I was okay and then we we had the walk and it was one of those um canal path ones you know all along the canal yes in London so that was yeah. really cool yeah. uh finished it in five hours which uh it wasn't that's not very fast <laughs> but still <laughs> uh, we finished it and we did it and um that's when I started to think about you know I looked for a few jobs and I I just sort of didn't I thought, you know, I'm going to make a big change. And that's when I decided to be self-employed. And yeah. one of the things I did was I wrote a little, you know, a couple of, I think I, I wrote three short stories about Dodger. Mm. So all of Dodger's books are tr true, based on truth. So I wrote the one about how he was abandoned and rescued. Yeah. And um, I made it that. You know, when he got his forever home, he's going to be the best little dog he could possibly be. Yeah. And he was like, when we used to go out for walks, he used to love other dogs. He used to have a few friends he played ball with. And he was like a really friendly little dog, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I wrote the first story on him being abandoned, but then him being forgiving, you know, and 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 wanting to be happy and wanting to share and wanting to have friends so I wanted to teach children you know that sort of like bad things can happen but you can be happy you know yeah. things can yeah. change and then I wanted to mix it in with the fact that he was a staffy and you know he got a bad reputation Definitely. so little did I know how it would even evolve then but that was like the vision you know yeah. So in the book, we talked about sharing and playing and, and it was all true. It was all things he did, you know. Mm. And then the second book I wrote was um, a true story. So one day we went over the marshes and um, Dodger, Dodger was about six months old when we got him. He was about seven months. And I used to let him off the lead and he used to run off and like come back and I used to blow a whistle. He used to come back. Anyway, this day it had been snowing and he didn't come back. Oh. And I was lost him for about a quarter of an hour, couldn't find him. Anyway, mm. he'd run down to the riverbank and there was all litter and all that. And he, he'd like somehow managed to fall into the river lee. But, oh, yeah. And I climbed, I, in the end, I heard him crying and I got to him. There was cans, bottles all around him and he was sucking under. Anyway, I pulled him out. And then we couldn't get back up the riverbank. Oh, and no. I called my daughter. She come and got us and helped us. And I wrote that story, which was about that. And it was like, don't run off when you're in, you know, out to children. You know, it's dangerous. Yeah. Um, don't drop litter like it's dangerous. Talked about the ducks living in the water. Talked yeah. about not going close to the water's edge. And that was like my second book, Dodger Dog's Muddy Mistake. And then... <laughs> We decided to get Brilliant. a second dog. As I said, we had two before, and one of those Dalmatians was deaf. So there was a dog at Southridge. Um, she's called Shane now, but her name was Holly, and she she was a – she. you know, the, sorry, the phone keeps dinging, so everybody seems to be ringing me. But <laughs> I'm all, it always happens, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, you went silent so, for a second then, yeah. Yeah, apologies. No, right. no worries. So basically what happened was um, I wrote one. We, we got Shay. Shay's deaf. Uh, she's a staffy. She's half staff. And then the other half is Sharpay and German Shepherd. So she's a bit of a mixture, a bit of a Heinz 57. Right. But she, she was deaf. And I'd had a deaf dog. So Purdy, my, one of my Dalmatians, was deaf. So right. I, I know dog sign language. And I, and I was, you know, I'd had Purdy for 15 years. So I decided to get a deaf dog. So Going in wow. the ilk of the two books that I'd written, then I naturally wrote Shay's rescue story. And that was like Dodger getting a sister. Dodger's yeah. sister's got a disability. Uh, so they're a mixture of like dog welfare, doggies for life, and then values and behaviours, you know, for the kids. Mm. So that's how I started. And um, I, they were just my little stories. But what happened was I started to think about illustrating them when I started my own business, I started to think about the books and um, I joined networking and I started networking. And when I was networking, I met 
Kim Weimer. So she's yeah. the illustrator uh, of the Dodger Dot books. Simply by chance, she used to do murals for people in like right. kids' oh. walls. And so I said, oh, I wonder if you could draw like cartoon Dodger. And I gave her pictures of Dodger, the real Dodger, and and she sort of made the pictures from that and we struck up a friendship and, that, and, and that's just history now really. So Fantastic. I wrote more books. We started out doing little events with a pasting table and some homemade dog cookies and a few balloons. And now we have, a, you know, a double gazebo. It's blingy. We do crafts and we do the national pet show we do markets and events pre-covid yes. although we did a few um events then you know in the um during the time we did we did more markets last year and yes. we're going back friday actually so we right. we got merchandise we got we've got actually 11 books now um that wow. are stories and we've got four activity books which are all also educational there's one about the environment and you coloring mm. it, it's all linked and one about being healthy and a bit of covid wash your paws and then the stories are well, those three books that i spoke about they're all published so there that's um how i became dodger dog dodger dog's yeah. muddy mistake and when dodger meets shay so that's her mm. rescue story yeah. and then i I, started to, I wrote one about breed-specific legislation. So going back to what I said about my, my opinion of the staff, you know, that my misguided thoughts, I wrote a book about breed-specific legislation, which is a law in this country yes. where if they believe that your dog, which on average is a staff, uh, looks like a pit bull, the police yeah. can seize it. They can put it in kennels. It could be destroyed or it could have um, like have to wear a muzzle, never be let off the lead again in public. You know, you have to have fences. You're legally owning that dog. So if the dog goes, anything happens, like you're, you could be prosecuted. But some of these dogs are seized in very quite aggressive um, sort of encounters some puppies are seized, right? And the dog doesn't do anything. It's just by what it looks like. Yeah, of course. And they can spend the first year of their life or a year of their life in police kennels or in, you mm. know, in isolation. And it's a very costly process for the taxpayer and takes a lot of police, court time. And it hasn't ever affected any kind of um, aggression in dogs. It hasn't really done anything. So, that we met people who were campaigning. So Dodger, we got onto that with um, Dodger Dog Learn Something New. Yeah. And it talks about, it explains to children about the law, but again, don't judge people by their appearance. Don't judge people by their reputation. So it kind of always links, do you know, you know both yeah, ways. Yeah, it makes sense, yeah. Totally. So we did that, and actually, Dodger's got a video on um, it's well, it's on YouTube. Dodger's I love Dodger Dog YouTube page, and uh, Dodger's the um, dog and bone man. And instead of singing um, human, he sings canine, and it's got the words change that I changed. So, yeah, if anyone's interested in hearing about Dodger's mission, and that's what mm. we talk about, we talk about. Dodgers on a mission, you know, to change perception, yes. to change people, to be kind. It's cool to be kind. Yeah. And um, it was interesting. So we've got books about the oceans. We've got books about the caravan, which is about the beach and country code. We've got a book about death, which we had so many requests in the end to write a book about death, to teach yeah. children about yeah. death and bereavement. And strangely, that was released um last march so right. um yeah like that was a really you know that was we released out crufts actually the last crufts before right, lockdown right. that was timely wasn't it and that even that is like everything's a true story so dodger loves the caravan um dodger's uh brother who's a cat his name's walt he features in the books um his sister got hit by a car so she did it she's um my dad's cat and she's Walt's sister because they were all born in his back garden to a stray cat. 
Mm. And um, she, Susie, unfortunately, one morning she didn't come in for breakfast and my dad found her as she was in the road and she oh. died. So we used that story to talk yeah. about that death and the family and then that was an, an accident and then we had one about another cat, Donald, what we used to have and that was an illness and we explain about burials and funerals and it's all very honest. Mm. no cat or kittens gone to the farm or anything like that do you know what I mean it's the truth and yeah. the way it was very well researched um so yeah and wow. Dodger Dog finds a job well I suppose that's the piece to the story that I haven't told you about so Dodger is a pet therapy dog mm. now mm. and um He's, he goes to residential homes, he goes to secure mental health units, he works with dementia patients, brain injury patients, children. Um, in fact, he won an award last February and he's what they call um, a Bart's Health Hero. So he goes to hospitals and places within Bart's Health here in London. So yeah. probably people might know that's where... Um, Prince Philip was, wasn't he, in Bath? Right, right, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. he goes there to radiology, to intensive care. Admittedly, hasn't been since last March, but he's no. waiting to get back there. So one of his books, Dodger Dog Finds he's a Job. He's been on all... furlough, has he? Yeah, furlough. <laughs> yeah, very good. <laughs> I should have used that. I'm, I'm going to use that now. <laughs> okay, that'll be on best... Twitter before you can put the phone down on this. Yeah, so, uh, be, that's the best example of furlough I've ever yeah. heard. <laughs> so he's been in the metro. He's been like on all different things. He's had yeah. stuff. There's videos about his journey. But basically, you know, he's such a loving little dog and he loves people. And Oh, wow. He, he, so he does that. And, um, yeah, we've been, we was doing that. He, and he won. He was the first dog to be nominated for a Hero Award. So every year, all the NHSs they have heroes, and it's always yes. like nurses, doctors, or you know, yeah. people who get nominated by patients and other yeah. stuff. So Dodger was nominated, and um, Dodger, he, well, he went to the dinner. He had a tux. He <laughs> went there. He thought he was Snoop Dogg because he had a, a blingy <laughs> collar with Dodger in diamonds on it, and a dart of diamonds lead and a tux. So, yeah, he, he Snoop dogged it out. He was very uh, keeping Snoop with the staff, it. you know, the staff image. And oh um, in that work, actually, we've we've done a lot of work with kids who've been stabbed victims, uh, kids who've been gunshots, uh, acid attacks. So we go to the trauma unit and, mm. we, you know, we talk about, again, that he's got a tough image, but you don't need to be tough and... You know, he doesn't fight, you know, but he's got a reputation that staff's fire, but he doesn't fight. So mm, mm. we're kind, we're trying to work with all these different people to get them to realise, you know, that um, violence and we go into schools, um, we read our books in schools. And um, so we're just trying to get this message across of, love kindness my latest book that's been illustrated now is called um dodger dog chooses happiness so again it's about teaching yeah. children that happiness is a choice yeah. and how to stay happy so it's think of things to look forward to talk so we've got one about anti-bullying that's about talking yeah. so my work with the samaritans and the work that i've done with some of the mental health places as well with Dodger, we've learned a lot and we try to put mental health as a quite of a forefront as well in, in some of the books, like the um the one about death, Dodger Dog says goodbye. That's got a lot of mental health things to support children, you know, yeah, through yeah. grief. So yeah, we're just kind of going wow. on and on and, so, and just I trying mean, to spread um, the word. Brilliant. It sounds just amazing. And you've made such a career for him, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> what, what, where did his name come from or what does it mean? Does it mean anything? Uh, it does mean something, yeah. So um, probably get me put, put away at some stage if I make it big in America. So, right, Dodger's dad, my husband, is a big baseball fan. 
right. and he sports the LA Dodgers. Right. So when we got Dodger, he just wanted to call him Dodger, yeah? So in the books, it's funny, right? So he's in, it, in the books, he's Dodger Dog. Yeah. But he's he's not really called Dodger. He's called Dodger. And then my, my other dog, who uh, we adopted, she's called Shay. So Shay is Shay Stadium. It's a baseball stadium. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, you know, it wasn't, when they were named, it wasn't going to become what it is. But again, I wanted everything to be truthful. So they're their names. That's what they're called, actually. But yeah. it's kind of funny. It, it's really worked well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Because I was, because when, when we first got in touch, I was kind of researching it and I was just like, really, really curious about it. I'm going to sneeze in a second. Hold on. I'm going to mute. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. That's all right. So, um, bless you. Thank you. Right. So, um, yeah. It, so they're all, their names are true. Their names are real, and yeah. basically, um, that's why we we name them after the baseball thing, really, just because you know it was just my husband's choice so but i call him dodger dog and and the books are available in other languages so we're trying to get them all in right. so we've got them in spanish and we've got them uh what uh french german we've actually got one in norwegian which is i know it's a bit random but my daughter's learning norwegian and she wanted me to put them in norwegian so i did um but so he's he's dodger in all the foreign language books uh yeah. but that we we let the dog be the language so he's dodger el perro and he's dodger shen he's dodger hund so they always change the dog but they always leave the names so it's kind of cute really i think God, got you yeah have you got have you done one in dutch yet no i'll have to do one in dutch when i well, there's not that many around in, in the netherlands yeah i mean it will be dodger hond h-o-n-d yeah, so funny that Hund, but it's H U N D in, in German. Um, German and yes. in Norwegian. Oh right, right. So yeah. like, I suppose it doesn't change much. No, but I like Dodger. I like Dodger El Perro because yeah. it, I, it reminds me of Antonio Banderas when he's the cat. You know? Oh yes, 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 yes. And it's yes. like Dodger El Perro, and I imagine him like. <laughs> El <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think it's kind of cool. Yeah, very cool. So this must be a full time job, Dodger. Well, yeah. I mean, basically, the life the lifestyle I lead is one you know that's very busy. Even in um, lockdown, yeah. Um, I, I so I'm a, I was a regional leader for London for four networking for a networking organization. Yes. And I'd always did that. And then when lockdown happened, they went online, you know, so yeah. they're like in Teams type Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I became a host and an ambassador for looking after well, seven groups um, a week. And Ooh. then with the volunteering, because Dodger was furloughed, as you yeah. <laughs> and um, I wasn't. So basically, I began the first last year. I all through the lockdown, I was a, an NHS befriender, and that right. was because yeah. of some of our work with one of the secure units that we could visit. And I had five clients, and um, what I did was I, um, I I befriended them, and I used to speak to them twice a week for half an hour, five different people, yeah, and yeah. Um, basically just looked after them where the, some of their mental health things were um, not, you know, not so much. There were people who were real, people, they, the carers mm. maybe. So what we did was that I joined that volunteering and I was doing that. And then I did a few markets when it eased, but I, I did a lot more online stuff and things yes. like that. So yeah. I did that volunteering as well. And then this year, after Christmas, um, I began volunteering at the vaccine centre at the Excel. 
So, in fact, I was there this morning. So I do two days a week at the vaccine centre. Um, mm. I do the, the the networking thing. I've got clients, coaching clients that I do on Zoom. And so, yeah, I've been busy. I've kept myself out of trouble. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've got so many questions. Um, so whilst, whilst we're still on Dodger, what's the best way then for people to support your work that you're doing with dodger what what how can people support that share that with us well of course you you can buy dodger's books and yeah 25 percent of any profits we we give to if we work with all different rescues we've got soft toys that we sell where a hundred percent of the product uh, profits goes to um, dog rescues, children's charities, things like that. Yeah. So yeah. It's, we do a lot of stuff. We're looking to become a foundation, the Dodger Dog Foundation, mm -hmm. and we're looking to do like rescue work, supporting rescues, supporting a lot of smaller charities as well, yeah. and um, also overseas because the books, we do sell them internationally and like we've got them in Spanish. So we've helped romanian spanish greek rescues you know singapore mm. like street dogs uh mm. soy dogs which is for uh, stopping the meat trade so we we've given to lots of these different charities um mm. we've raised money for all different things we did the tough mudder we did that with dodger uh, yeah. and that was for battersea so we do loads of charity work we do have actually a just giving at the moment so um, we are doing a walk every day on Instagram and Facebook. You can see Dodger and Shay's walk and they're yeah. walking for the NHS right. and they've done it and they, they've got a Just Giving page. So you can help with that as well. Um, the latest book that's come out actually is about the air ambulance right. um, at the Royal London. So Dodger went in the air ambulance and Dodger is um, – using that the air ambulance shops are going to be selling that and, and they're getting it at cost they're keeping all the profit right. so that got a bit waylaid you know because of covid but mm. as we're coming out now there should be quite a big sort of release of that book and it should be have quite a lot of publicity yeah. but dodger actually went in the air ambulance on top of the royal london hospital it was pretty high and it was very cold that day but it was wow. a great experience so buying these books but buying his soft toys in particular and supporting his charity work is, is always good. So where can people see all that? Where can they? So you can go on. So Dodger's got a website, which is www.dodgerdog.co.uk. Um, mm. Dodger's got Facebook and Instagram. It's at I love Dodger Dog, so you can look him up on that. Yeah. And um, on Just Giving, you can also... Karen G, Dodger Dog, and his Just Giving page comes up right. that he's been working on throughout the whole of the pandemic. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and also you can, on his, we've just literally populated some markets that we're going to be at. So if anyone's in Sittingbourne or East London, Walthamstow, Folkestone, yeah. we get yeah. about, and then when the events open, we... Um, We'll be all over the place, hopefully. Yeah. We also visit schools and we do visit like different places where, you know, people invite us. So if people are interested like in um, us coming and reading a story in the school, Dodger meeting the children. So he has done a couple of, he's done two visits during lockdown that were COVID safe, but yeah. coming out of it now, it'll, they'll be able to have more visits and we yeah you can look at everything on our facebook pages and on our you can see what we get up to brilliant and um you can invite and we don't charge so if we go to your school and we we sell our books but we don't make a charge it's all free oh wonderful wonderful thank you for that i'll obviously we'll include all of that in the show notes as well so tell us a bit about your coaching business then karen so I I do coaching with a tool. Now I don't know if you've heard of Myers Briggs MBTI. Oh yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Very much so. so I'm yeah. a licensed practitioner for that. 
So yeah, for people who don't know, it's psychometric profiling based on the work of Carl Jung, and it explains to you about yourself. It's about self-awareness, yeah. and it helps you to make sure that you spend your time doing things that you are fulfilled and that you enjoy and that you don't you don't try to focus on doing things that you don't like. If you're things that you don't like that you have to do, then we work around how you can change your thought patterns or change what you do, yeah. like and work to, to achieve things, you know, in a balanced way. Yeah. So I use that and I do different talks or different um I do, yeah, talks and uh, events. I do team events. I have individual clients. And um, again, if anyone's interested, a good place. We've got Karen. Um, we've got what's it? Sorry, www.gdevelopment.co.uk. But Karen G, if you, if anyone's on LinkedIn, um, mm. please, you know, connect with me. Say that you saw me on the podcast. And um, you can see the recommendations and the videos and so the things. I've had that business yeah. in eight years now. Brilliant, brilliant. And and so how do you split your time? Because, you know, this is the challenge. I mean, lots of people out there doing multiple different things and it's always a challenge how you prioritise your time yeah. between different projects. How do you manage that? Um. I suppose I just try to structure my week, sit down and, and work out what, what I can do when. Um, like even then when I started working at the vaccine centre, um, what I did was I chose the day um, that I could, I would normally go to the hospital so yeah. that when things went back, um, someone's ringing me now. Again, I'm just trying to – right, I sent her a message, sorry. <laughs> right, so, um, yeah, I try to keep things structured. So, like, Tuesdays and Thursdays I go to the morning in the vaccine centre, but yeah. I used to always go to the hospital visits with Dodger. So right. I try to keep things so that they can be um, organised. So Mondays I used to network and do lots of admin. Then weekends I would always be at events. Um so I see clients in the evenings or sometimes I used to see them Mondays, Wednesdays. So I, I keep certain days free and I try to block out chunks of time. Right. But I do that and, I, and I, that's one of the things that a lot of people need coaching with. I, I help people make business plans, model weeks yeah. um, because it's important to have structure and that's yeah. why I tried to keep that during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, that sounds cool. That sounds great. And and with the Myers Briggs stuff that you do, do you do workshops and things, or do people just take the tests, or how does that work? Well, they they take the test, but then they have they they, they have two hours coaching, which explains the tests with them. That's right. normally how we start. But right. I do workshops. I've done mini workshops. I've done lots of different things over the years with it. But yeah. what works best is that if, if I have a coaching client, then they have to have either had Myers-Briggs done in the past or do the Myers-Briggs. Yeah. And then what they do, they buy a block of coaching sessions and they can use one of them for the debrief of the Myers-Briggs yeah. or they can just buy a package which is, the profile and and the the debrief right. so and then but most people that it's not often that people only do the Myers-Briggs they tend to do it and then continue coaching and then when yes. they're having the coaching we work on you know their thoughts their feelings their behaviors and what they're doing right. and then we help them to understand like I do lots of things and and if I didn't have good time management then it would just collapse all around me yeah so we get people to talk about what's collapsing and really it sort of would probably link into what their profile tells them so for right. me I used to be a person who was like reckless and late and 
like just whatever fly by the seat of my pants and that's right. what my profile says that I do but because I learned to understand myself I yes. have to force myself to be organized or force myself to work in a certain way so mm. it's about self-development with an understanding of if you don't develop what's going to be the impact on your your life and your business yeah 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 fa fascinating i mean i didn't it's myers briggs just remind me it's those with the four letters you get that's it yeah 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 i think i'm i can't remember but i'm like a I might get this wrong. I'll have to look back now to see when I did it. it must be years ago. But like F N T J N T J rings a bell. N T J something like that. Does that make sense? So it's right. So yeah, it does. So I'm an ENFP, okay. which is extroverted intuition, feeling, and perceiving. Yeah. So you right. have two letters, and you you're not one and not any of the other you're just a lead with one yeah that's right so if you're an e you've you you've got extroversion which that's is where you like to mix with people get thoughts chat things through if you've got introversion you like to contemplate procrastinate think before you then maybe ask someone else what they think so you're even e, e or an i yeah and I then, think I think I'm an ENTJ from memory. Now, now you've said okay. that. Okay, so that would be then an N is about intuition, right? And then you you've got an N and an S, and the S is sensing. So right. intuition is futuristic global outlook, what it could be. Yeah, and an S is that's what it is. It's black and white. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you've got the T and the F. Well, thinking and feeling, do you make your decisions on logic with your head or do you make them on emotion with your heart? Right, right. And then you've got your J and your P. So your yeah. J is about planning, knowing what you're going to do, not yeah. having any surprises, completely understanding what's expected and what you're going to do making decisions quite quickly, liking to get closure on a decision so you yeah. know where you are. Yeah. Where at, and that's what you are then. And so then me, that's yeah. me, you know, that's the one I've had to work on to be more like you because yeah. I'm like fly by the seat of my pants. Can I fit this in in this minute? Yeah, I can. Oh, that's going to make me late. Or <laughs> can I wait and do this? You know, and, and it's about going with the flow, you know, not, yeah. no decision before you're really ready to make that decision. And, then you could just go off and do something last minute. You don't need to have it planned. So yeah. it's, it's it is one so fascinating. Trouble. Yeah. Yeah. It is yeah. so fascinating and scarily accurate. Yeah, I know. And yeah, so I'm definitely ENTJ. That that's that now now you've said all that and described it. That's me absolutely one hundred percent. And the thing is, I haven't changed. I mean, it's years nah, you, ago yeah. since I did that. And it's just who you are, isn't it? It's yeah. just that's how yeah. you've been conditioned, how you'll live your life. And you're right. If if there is areas you need to work on, then, yeah, <clears throat> you just got to be aware of it, haven't you? Mm. Yeah, yes. you have to. And you have to own it and take own responsibility it. for it. Yeah. I like so that. So what Carl Jung says... What irritates us about others actually teaches us more about ourselves. I know, I know. <laughs> My wife and I have this standing kind of thing that we do when, you know, one of us says, oh, such and such. It says, well, I don't like that person because of this, you know, or look at him or her. If she's done this. It says, well, what part of that is it reminding of yourself? Of going, yeah, oh, yeah. No, I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the thing. So what happens is um, things that we're less of, other people leading on can irritate us as well. But sometimes people are doing something that we do, but it just irritates us because maybe it's, it's one of our qualities that we're not so keen on. So when we see other people doing it, 
we don't understand that that's how people might feel at that time when they hear or see us doing it because probably it is an irritating thing. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Oh, it's a fascinating subject. And I think it's such a, a great, like, balance with what you're doing with Dodger and that work, you know, helping kids understand themselves better and educating them and then helping adults as well. Mm. Well, adults are still kids, aren't they? But using an adult tool <laughs> to help adults understand themselves better as well. So I think it's beautiful combination of the two things that you're doing, Karen. You're doing amazing work. Oh, bless you. Thank you very much yeah, for your kind amazing. work. No, you're doing really amazing work and, and it's good to see and it's, you know, I mean, and who who doesn't love dogs and who doesn't want, you know, um, kind of staffies doing well in the world mm. as well, you know, and being educated about the breed mm. and using that breed to educate children. Uh, I, I think it's fabulous. When well, it, no when one did... should be judged on their appearance, should they? I mean, it's just no one. Look at what's happening in America. It's yes. absolutely shocking. I mean, no one should be treated any differently or judged because of what they look like. No. And there is also another thing, actually, about the dog thing, you know, and animals. Mm -hmm. So um, people, humans that... Um, perpetrate violence, uh, murders, tortures, attacks of any description, you know, yeah. they, they, they enjoy that and that they, 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 they feel a high and adrenaline rush, you know, when they cause pain, when they kill, when they, yeah. all these things, right. They don't wake up generally one morning and just go off and do that. Right. If you look back at their childhood, they yeah. were pulling legs off spiders. They were chasing pigeons. They were putting rockets to cat's tails. They were killing whatever. They they start to have this, this sort of sadistic, like this streak, and it actually does start with animals. It's not just about even the animals and stopping the cruelty. The fact is identifying animal cruelty, especially yeah. in young people, can be the start of getting them off of a road where, you know, violence becomes such a big part of their lives yeah. because the violence is is for pleasure in, in gangs, in, like, torture. Like, the, a lot of these things is for pleasure. Dog yeah. fighting, it's for pleasure. So it's very important that we stop children and make them understand that, you know, a pet is needs to be loved, needs to be nurtured. And like I think that having pets teaches children about respect for animals, about responsibility, someone's waiting for them, someone needs them, someone has to be fed, someone has yeah. to. It's about teaching you skills that you're going to need, you know, yeah. when you grow up. So yeah. I think it is. But. People who perpetrate violence, you look back and you'll see that they, they've started with animals, dissecting frogs, even anything where, you know, killing and maiming gives, it gives them pleasure. So it's actually pretty serious psychological stuff, you know. Yeah, 100% right. And it, it, it gets conditioned in to the mind and to the brain over a period of time when, as you say, they don't know any different mm. and they believe that's just the way it should be. Yeah, it becomes the norm. Becomes the norm, yeah. And, I mean, we're all conditioned in some way, you know, for mm. different reasons, yeah, different yeah. things that we've been conditioned into. Some, some are good, mm. but some are bad. I mean, I did some research 2013, I did an article for a journal, a psychology journal to do with social media and how that's affecting everybody uh, in good and bad ways. But this article was looking at the bad ways and I'd come across previously, actually, an experiment they did in the, I think it was in the 60s or maybe even earlier, 
which was a really bad experiment that was showing children uh was an adult hitting a doll mm. uh physically and um children were watching and then they put the children in the room they were watching through a window and then they children went into the room and they just replicated what that adult did mm. they weren't shown what to do but they just copied yeah. and replicated it but that's even about how you talk to people it's about yeah. respect if your parents don't say please and thank you if they're aggressive if you see them fighting if you see them drunk if you see your mother being you know beaten like these are things that stay with you and they affect yeah. you in different ways. Now, not everyone becomes a drunk or a wife beater, but mm. a lot do. But yeah. all, but you might become quite aggressive or quite withdrawn. You, you could not reach your full potential through the way that you've been raised and the things that you've seen. So yeah. it's important that we try to make children understand that they have a voice and that they need to speak up. And without saying it, but not, you know, your parent isn't maybe always right, depending on what their behaviours are or addictions or health conditions or mental health especially. That's so right. we need to get kids to kind of not grow up too soon, definitely, but to understand right and wrong. And it doesn't matter who the person is. It can be someone that you love. It can be someone close to you. But what they're doing might be wrong. So it's mm. about that, really. But in a gentle sort of way that they learn it from for themselves. Because after all, as a coach, you don't tell people. You get people to explore stuff. Same as Samaritans. We, we don't give advice. We get mm. people to explore feelings and explore stuff and then yeah. make their decision over what they want. It's called... Yeah self-determination it's about we are the captain of our ship yeah so yeah fantastic stuff. we 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 could chat about it for hours <laughs> i know we have it's been so fascinating to hear your story and all the things that you're doing and again i'll repeat amazing work oh thank you you you've shared some websites and social media handles already. Are there any that we need to mention in addition to those? Uh, not really. I mean, I think if you put Karen G and Dodger Dog or Karen G Development, anything, I pop up all over the shop. Fantastic. So I think I'm kind of... Um, yeah, SEO yeah, is working. It's, work, it's doing something, yeah. Brilliant. Fantastic. Well... I, I'll include all of those anyway in the notes and uh, hopefully people can Google you and get involved, everybody. Get involved with Dodger Dog, get involved with uh, Myers-Briggs, um, highly recommended. Um, Karen, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank you. No, um, and uh, I don't know, where where is that Dodger? Dodger. Dodger. I'm done. Yeah, thank you. Let's get him. He won't get up. Right. Here he is. Oh, oh, oh hello, Dodger. He's cutting in and out. Yeah, I can see him. Oh, you see you're him? gorgeous. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I can see him. Oh. From the chair. Good. And then yeah. this is she. She's the one who's deaf. Oh, <laughs> background, their backgrounds are a bit of a nightmare, actually. But yeah, there you go. They're real. Oh, maybe I should turn the thing back. <laughs> so yeah, they're <laughs> real. That's brilliant. Thank you for showing those. No, thank you for having us, and um, I enjoy everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. And you too, Karen. Take care. Bye. Bye for now. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.